evening. I see just uh, just few left, just few hardcore developer left. We'll come on the last session of Synergia and the last session about HTML5. My name is Stepan Bechinsky, I'm developer evangelist in Microsoft Czech Republic. And in my last session about HTML5, I will speak about uh, JavaScript APIs and about uh, JavaScript itself. As you probably know, the correct name of uh, JavaScript is ECMAScript. ECMAScript is driven by ECMA standardization organization and the number of this standard is 262. And I will show you some new stuff in uh, ECMAScript 5. The previous version of ECMAScript was the version 3. There were a big gap between 3 and 5, so they decided to make this not the version 4, but the version 5, because there's a lot of new. Again, what is new in ECMAScript is closer to industry needs. You probably, maybe some of you have been on my previous sessions. So the whole idea of HTML5 and the ECMAScript 5 is a part of HTML5, is to be as close as possible to industry needs. So for example, we have some new methods on some objects, for example, index of, and so on for the array. We have some new uh, object model, which is much easier to maintain and work with them. And we have some more new functions and methods we'll see later. I think the very important thing is the strict mode. Strict mode, if you switch the strict mode on, you cannot do something in JavaScript. For example, you cannot create variable without declaration using the keyword var. It's not possible. Why? Because if you declare variable without the var keyword, you create a global variable, even if you declare it inside a function. And it's bad for JavaScript. For example, you cannot make an object with two properties of the same name. Again, it's error. Probably it's some mistake in typing or something like this. Second very important thing is the asynchronous execution of the script. Maybe you know if the parser of the HTML starts parsing the HTML source code and HTML parser found, found some JavaScript or CSS, it stopped working and put to the job to another parser, to CSS parser or JavaScript parser. So for example, if you have a lot of CSS starts at the beginning in a lot of files, we have a lot of JavaScript included at the beginning. It takes much more time to load the page because the HTML parser must stop on every CSS and over on every JavaScript and wait for the response from another, uh, another parser. So for example, if you have some JavaScript code and you know that you don't need this JavaScript code really at the beginning of the of the life of the page, so for example, in the load method of the document, you can you should put this JavaScript on the bottom of the file. But it's sometimes hard to maintain it because everyone is looking for the script at the beginning. So now you can use this async attribute. And when you use async attribute, the JavaScript file is parsed asynchronously. So the parser of the HTML can continue working and the page is visible for the end user sooner. But be aware, you cannot put this epping script anything what you need at the beginning of the life of the page. So anything inside the load, document load, for example, cannot be in this epping JavaScript because you don't know if it will be ready or not. Let's have a small look on the statistic. Uh, ECMAScript organization has some official ECMAScript tests how, how web browsers are working with the JavaScript. So here you can see results. There are more than 11,000 tests and you can see how many test fails in which browser. I ran this test two weeks ago so it's really, this is really new numbers and really the last versions of the browsers. Okay, let's have a look to for, uh, let's look to demos. Okay, the first, some new methods for arrays. So here you can see 
I have a typical array, and there are some new methods like index of for each is uh, iteration through the array. Every it's some kind of let's say filter. Some again some kind of the filter and so on. Everything here you can see you can you it was possible to do it in the previous version of JavaScript, but you need to iterate through the array manually or you know it was not a, it was not so easy to use it. You needed some co more code or again. Those functions you can find in some JavaScript libraries, for example, in jQuery. So now it's as part of the specification. Strict mode. So I show it on undeclared variables. So if you want to switch strict mode on, you just use this literal at the beginning of your code. And if some web browser doesn't understand strict mode, okay, nothing happened. And now this code in the standard JavaScript, it's correct. I have variable A, I have variable B. Both of, of them are global variables. It's, but it's possible to do it, but it's, uh, you know, not so good for maintaining JavaScript code and so on. And in the strict mode, I have exception here, because it's not allowed in the strict mode. Maybe if, you're, if someone of you is a Visual Basic developer, it's very similar to, the, to switch option explicit. It does almost the same as option explicit in JavaScript code. Okay, so let's move forward. One of the most interesting, probably, and one of the, probably my favorite API is the geolocation. Geolocation API allows you to get the position of the physical device. For example, the typical usage is you come somewhere with your mobile device or tablet, is those the most portable one, you know, the, the laptop is not so portable, you need to car to carry it. And you are searching or you are looking for some restaurant. And you put to the search engine restaurant. And of course, it shows you a lot of restaurants. But if the search engine can work with the geolocation, it shows, it shows you the nearest one. And it's, it works fine. It's what are, you are looking for. You don't want to travel across the city to have a beer. You need the nearest one. How it works, there are different methods how you can be located. I will speak now especially about connected devices. I mean smartphones and tablets. It works a little different way on the standard computer and on the typical standard computer as laptop is, you can get some, sometimes you can get strange results. And the reason is that on the laptop, you don't have enough information to locate you. If you have typical smartphone device, on the level of the operating system, there is a geolocation service. This geolocation service tracking your position based on GSM network, if you have a GSM module inside, wireless networks around you, and sometimes by the GPS. So if your application inside the browser asks for the location, the browser asks geolocation service on the device, and the device probably has the cached lo the location is probably cached. For example, on Windows Phone, the location is refreshed like every 10 minutes or something like this, and it gives you some location. The precision is in hundreds of meters. If you are not using GPS, well, if you are using GPS, the precision is in meters. But without the GPS, it's in hundreds of meters. So the typical picture is, on my screenshot there, the pinpoint is a Microsoft building in Prague, Czech Republic, and the radius shows me the precision of my location, and it's 350 meter uh, radius. And it's quite enough to find, you know, pop or something like that. It works. If you have GPS, it's, my, it's much more precise. If you don't have GPS, you don't have Wi-Fi, and you are a mobile device, you can be located by GSM network. It really depends on the area. 
in the cities, there are a lot of GSM towers, the BTS towers, there are a lot of them. Again, you can be located in precision with hundreds of meters. If you are outside the city, so there are not so many GSM networks, uh, network towers, there are not so, there are no Wi-Fi, for example, even in kilometers. And especially if you are using some laptop, sometimes you are located just by your IP address, and there you can have problems. So last, uh, on Monday, I had the same speech in Bratislava, in Slovak Republic. I have been located by IP address, and I have been in the Microsoft office in uh, Bratislava. And it locates me to the Microsoft office because the IP address in the Reading in the United Kingdom. I, of course, I want to go for beer to the United Kingdom, but it's far, far away if you are thirsty. Okay. So let's have a look. For, let's show some demos. I know it worked here. I test it. So I go to some sample site, locate me. As you can see on the bottom, I must allow access to my position once or forever or forever denied. Allow. And I think it's quite good because this is the Sava Center. This is uh, inter Intercontinental Hotel. And I think it's good. The precision is quite good. It's, again, 300 meters, something like this. But let's say it's enough. So what happened on the background? My computer or my application asked the browser to locate me. And because there is no location, location service inside my laptop, the browser ask some location service directly. And here you can see the request. Uh, this request is from the Microsoft building Prague. Here you can see the list of Wi-Fi's around me in my in Microsoft building. It is sent it to some geolocation service. The geolocation service is here. And the result is again some XML with my latitude, with my longitude, and with some precision. And this happened on the background, and that's all. Let's look, uh, let's look at source code. Geolocation. You have object geolocation. Again, don't test the version of the web browser. Test if the functionality is available or not. And the method get current position. And you have two callbacks. The one, everything is OK. We have the location. Of course, the location special when we are located by just by IP address can be wrong. But it happens special in laptops, not on mobile devices, because there are the mobile devices has every mobile device has much more information about location than the standard laptop. Or there can be some problem. Timeout. I can't locate you for some reason. For example, it happened to me on the same session half year ago in Vilnius. It, it was not the system cannot locate me. Or user denied to get to get to uh, to give you a location. If everything is OK, you have uh, data in callback, latitude, longitude, and so on. So you didn't need parse anything. Everything is in some variable. And then you can set up uh, some map. I have a very simple, simple sample here. It's a virtual Earth imaginary service. I just create some long URL. There is my developer key on the end, and it renders a small map as a static image for me. And again, allow once, and this is the result. Okay. 
back to slides. Uh, how many of you have been on my first session? Okay, almost everyone. So you have seen the video element, you have seen the audio element, and you heard the question, okay, I want to style the control box. And I told you it's not possible. If you want to change the control box, you must write your own. And here we are. Audio and video has a quite big JavaScript API, which allows you to control audio, to control video. Of course, the culture like audio and video is uh, almost the same. And you can write your controls. Of course, I show it, but I think the most important stuff is you need to understand some events in audio and video. Because typical usage, for example, of the audio is you have some game, you have some music on the background of the game, and the music should be in some loop, or you have some more tracks, and you're randomly changing between tracks. One track ends, you want to start another one, and then another one, that the music is not again, again the same, but it, the music will be changed. It's a typical. Okay. Uh, where is it, where is it? I start with audio. As you can see here, I have uh, empty body. I create a new audio element. Again, I change if the audio element is supported. I'm not testing the version of Internet Explorer or the version of the browser, no. I'm testing the functionality that is available. If everything is OK, I set up the source. And before I can play it, I probably want to wait to buffer everything on my computer because then I can play it without interruption. If you start play it immediately, you may have probably because of the state of the line of the connection, you may have to you can have some problems. So you must wait, it stopped playing, you wait for buffering and so on. And the synchronization is if you want to run one track, then another one, then another one, and so on, you wait for the for the event ended, and then you can play something new. Uh, this one is a loop. This is the loop, but of course you know you don't need to do the loop this style because there is a property loop through. And just this is just the sample of the synchronization. Bazinga, bazinga, bazinga. Yeah, it goes again, again, again. If you have the problem with the synchronization, it can be it can be strange. So now I show you uh, one demo. Where's my demo? It's Frère Jacques. French song and if you look to the source code I'm using the developer tools it works so every note is in a separate file and this is my song so I save all note to my to some array and I just loop through the array and okay play this play this play this if you have problem with the synchronization Playing the piano the same style as her. Okay. So you need to work with the audio the correct way if you need to synchronize some tracks. For example, this is the reason that uh, maybe you know the Angry Birds game, and there is Angry Birds game in the Chrome, and it must use a flash for playing audio because of the reasons. The video is almost the same. So I have my video player. It's 
It's real simple. You just go ahead and you just grab the icon. Go down the I have button, right. stop, I click, play, yeah. and here you can see I have I have the time from the beginning. You probably expected some information if the video is paused, if the video is ended, you can play it, you can pause it, and so on. And if you need to work with the time, you have this uh, even time update. And using this and uh, property current time, you know where you are. And of course, you can use the seek method to jump to another part of the video, but it must be supported on the server. Okay. Offline capabilities. Offline capabilities are very, very important, again, for connected devices, smartphones, tablets, and so on. The typical usage of first of two, of first of two of them, the offline storage and online and offline events is, imagine, you are traveling somewhere, you are writing the email on some web page because you are connected using 3G or some wireless network in train, for example, somewhere and you lose the connection and you, you may not not you probably you don't notice it that the your small the icon on the rough, uh, right left corner changed so you push the button send and nothing happened probably you lose your you lose your work the typical usage is if you lost the connectivity operating system fires the event all subscribers know about it, and one of the subscribers to that event is my web browser. And the web browser fires event inside your web page. The event is offline. If you get this event, you disable the button send, and everything you store to the local storage, because the local storage is a permanent storage for your application, and you don't need any permission from the user to access this storage, to read it, to write it. And just send some, show the message, okay, we have no connectivity, your job is, is saved on your hard drive, you can switch your computer off, and then after we will have connectivity, we will send your email again. This is the typical usage. There are two kinds of the storages. The local one, as I told you, is the permanent one. Then you have a session storage, and session storage is live only when you are working in your web application, if you go to another web page, outside your web application, the session storage is deleted. The only what can be problem with you is that the size of the session storage and the local storage is five megabytes per each, and you cannot extend it. It's not possible to extend it because it's not part of specification. Another what you can do is applicate or you can use is application cache. The application cache allows you to download, to automatically download your application on the client so the client can run the application without the connectivity. If you want to use it, you must create the cache manifest. Cache manifest is the file describing which file of your application must be on the client, which, are, which must be on the network, and for example, you can tell, okay, I don't need this 20, 20 files because they are not mandatory for my application. This is the very common usage on iPhones. If you want to create the application for iPhone or iPad, this is a very common style using just the application cache. And the last one is index database API. Index database is some kind of the object database inside of a browser. So you can store your object inside the object database, maybe you know those name of NoSQL databases. This is the index DB. Take object and save it. Okay, demos. Question is, if there is some limit on the index database, as I know, there is no limit. But the index database is really at the beginning of the specification, so it can change in the future. What is typical on another platform, for example, on Silverlight, in Silverlight, you have uh, something like local storage, but it's the name for this is uh, isolated storage, but it's the same. The initial limit is one megabyte. If you need more, you can ask 
user, okay, I need, one, I need 200 megabytes, and user say yes, no. That's all. But it's not part of specification. Okay, local storage. It's very easy. Local storage object, session storage object. You are working in the style key value. If you want to save something in the storage, it might, you give the, some key to your value. And there is a one important thing because, you know, it's super easy to use it. But everything you put, you store inside the local storage or session storage turns to string even if it's a number. So when you read the data back, you must convert it to the original type. If you want to, st if you want to save some bigger structure, some object, you must first serialize this object to the string using the JSON. And then, if you read it back, deserialize it. It's a JSON stringify, a JSON parse. JSON object is two methods. Connectivity events, online, offline, and it really depends on you what you will do inside the code. The typical usage is, I'm offline, I save everything to the local storage. I'm online, I read it back and show it to the user. This is the typical usage. And cache manifest, the easiest cache manifest is just simple file like this. At the beginning should be cache manifest and the list of the files which you can store on the client. There are more keywords like a network, so if there is a network you in means every this don't store this on the client, it must be downloaded from the network and so on. And if you want to tell some page some page or some application, okay, use the application cache. Sorry is here. You use the attribute manifest for HTML element, and that's all. And everything is done by the browser. You doesn't take care of that. But of course, you can use you can access those information using some uh, application cache APIs. Let's move forward. WebSockets API. WebSockets API is, again, very interesting API. It is probably, it can be, in the future, it can be most used than HTTP. Because the HTTP protocol has the huge problems like stateless, server cannot contact client. For every request, you need to open connection. Of course, you can use some keep alive, but it Sometimes it doesn't work for some reason, and it's not full duplex, and it's a real old-fashioned protocol. And imagine you want to make a, some online game from using, the, for example, a canvas, and you, you need that your players can communicate real time. It's almost impossible to do it the real, the real, real time using the HTTP. It doesn't work. The HTTP protocol has a huge overhead, huge. So, for example, if you need to send, if well, let's look at it. Okay. Twelve network start capturing, and my city is Praha. So I send it the five characters, and it's 4,002 bytes because of five characters. And there is a huge overhead. The overhead is because of HTTP protocol. Uh, clear. Stop capturing. Seventeen kilobytes because of five characters. That's no sense. 
and this is the real oh me more and this is real this is the problem of http protocol so idea but if you want to use another protocol you must open this protocol on firewalls on proxies and it's again problem so the web sockets works very smart way the first handshake so first contact between client to server is on the http protocol level level and when this connection is open they you know they steal this connect they steal this tcp connection on the below http protocol they keep it alive and now you have open channel through all firewalls and through, through all proxies so the i think that web sockets is very interesting stuff, and now what is important, these WebSockets are stable now. I show you a little video about WebSockets, which is uh, approximately one year old, and there you can see all problems if you implement some specifications too early. Everything they are talking about is through. I have a great idea. I am going to build a site. I am really excited. They changed something I have a great with idea. HTTPS. I am going to build a site. I am really excited about it. We are the first to implement the WebSockets. Starting in the Google Chrome release 4.249, WebSockets are available and enabled by default. So, what is it? WebSockets are TCP for the web, a next generation bidirectional communication technology for web applications. We are the first to implement the WebSockets. Great. I just used them to build my new site. WebSockets specification was just updated to 75. What does that mean? WebSockets specification was just updated to 76. WebSocket specification was just updated to 77. Why are you telling me this? Developers should be aware that starting from Chrome 6.414, the client will talk to a server using 76 version of the protocol, so it will fail to open WebSocket based on 75 version. Sheet. My site just broke. Since 75 version of the protocol is obsoleted and no longer supported, you need to update the server implementation. Okay, so I just rewrote my site to the WebSocket 76. WebSocket specification was just updated to 78. WebSockets was just updated to 79. We are making great progress. Oh my fucking god. Important update. We've decided to disable support for WebSockets in Firefox 4, starting with Beta 8 due to a protocol level security issue. You must be shitting me. WebSockets is no longer supported. Have you heard about the index DB? Bite me. Okay. So if you are too quick to implement something, you can have this problem. So everything they told is true. There are security issues, they are switching on different web browsers on and off. A lot of fun around this. File API. Uh, file API allows you to access files on the computer, on the client computer. Of course, client, the user, must open this file or tell you, okay, we can save this. So it must, the user must really allows you to do something with some file. It's not possible to go and read all file system and manipulate with uh, any file you want. So everything must be allowed by user. Blob and file, it's uh, used for, for working with the files. File reader, like writing. File reader is for the reading files. There are some methods. The maybe, uh, you don't understand the last one, the read as data URL. It means it creates some kind of URL to your file on the computer. And this URL you can use as a CRS value, your CRS attribute value. So for example, if you have image, there is a CRS attribute. And this read as data URL, you can read it, you can put it as a value to that CRS attribute.
The question is about file API on the mobile devices. Uh, I don't know. I must check it. And it can be def uh, definitely different on different devices. So I am not sure it is supported on the mobile device. I don't know about it. Sorry. Okay, I have a input element for the file. Or you can use drag and drop. I will speak about drag and drop later today. I have list, I have even changed, so it means user added some, open some file. I take the file, I open the reader, I register event file is loaded, and then I read as data URL, and I can put it as the source for my new image. If you need to read a text file, it's quite similar. You open the stream to the file. You can read it, you can manipulate it, you can write it. Uh, web workers. Uh, you have seen the web workers in action uh, yesterday. Maybe you remember my video of 380s taking off from the Rosini airport. And on the top was the color video, and on the bottom in the canvas the video was black and white. I used the web workers for that. So web workers allows you to create a new thread, run something in new thread. So the main thread, the UI thread, the user interface thread, is still going and everything is work. If you are block UI thread, the application stop responds to the user. So if you are calculating something really big inside the UI thread, the application is irresponsible and the user is uh, angry. So if you want to run something in the, another thread in the, web, in the worker, you must put everything to the separate file, then you create a new object worker from some file, and you start the thread, send a message to the thread, thread is running, and when the thread is ending, it again sends the message back to your UI thread. Of course, inside the web worker, you can run another thread, and so on. But you must know that only UI thread, the main one, can change the web page. So it means only the UI, UI thread can change the document object model. So from the web worker, you don't have access to the document object model. So you need to do, so the, the UI thread must send all information to your thread. You do it, you, you make something, you send the data back, and the UI thread using, based on those data, for example, change the user interface or change the page. In the, in the web worker, you have access only to some parts of document object model. The name of this is mini DOM. So for example, you have access to the object window because you can need to read some data from the window object. For example, your location or something like this. And it works, but you cannot change anything in the document object model. It's only for the UI thread. So, I have here my web worker. The web worker is done from this file. You can see this file here. I register for the message event, and I have this callback. This message event is fired when the web worker call method post message. So I do some stuff, and here I take the screenshot of the video element. I call the post message on the worker object, and I send the data to the worker. In the worker, I must register on message, message event again. I get the data. I do something. Post message. Add and goes back to my event listener. And that's all. Of course, you can, uh, you can kill the thread from the main uh, 
from the main uh, thread. Uh, you can uh, send some information about the progress from your thread on the, on the background and so on. But it's a very simple multi-threading system here. So it's not so difficult to use it as, for example, on the, standard, on the C or C sharp on Visual Basic, something like this. Uh, drag and drop. <coughs> no, now we have the standardized version of drag and drop. The system is very, again, very simple. If you want to drag some element or some piece of the page, the draggable attribute on that element must be true, or it is it auto, so something is draggable, something not. It depends on uh, it depends on implementation in the web browser. So if you want to drag something, just attribute draggable set as true, and then you have the three main events you will take care of. Of course, there are more events, but the three are most important. When users start dragging the drag start event occurred. Inside this drag start event, you must fill data transfer object with the information you can drop somewhere. If you come to some element, there is a, there is a drag over event occur, and in drag event of, and drag, in drag over event, you can, you can check what is inside the data transfer and you allow or you not to drop information in that place. If you allow it to drop the information, you have the drop event, you read the information from data transfer object and you can do with those information something. So you are, the, the, you are transferring data from one one part of the page to another one using data transfer object. So first you need to save data inside the data transfer object and on the end you need to read them. Sorry. Use another browser. So I take my picture. So the drag start event occur. And if I move it the right side, you can see the cursor of my mouse looks like this. Uh, don't stop it. Don't stay here. Uh, you know, sign on the on the street. Now drag over event occurs and see the microser change because I tell OK, you can drop it here. I do it and I move the A380 text. If I do it here, it looks different because you can put the data transfer object, you can put more information and every target can use just part of this information. Okay, drag start, I save this information and some URL and you can put some name to every information. Drag over, drop effect tells you if you can do drag and drop or not. The move is fine and drop, I just check Attribute value, it's a custom data attributes I'm using here. I have two targets, one, two. I have my custom data attribute, if I can work with the text or URL. I just check it here, and then I change something in the drop target. Quite easy. Okay, what you, can, what you can use to write HTML5 applications or to test it, to you know, debug JavaScript code, to, to do some performance tests in JavaScript and so on. The first one is Internet Explorer 9 or 10 developer tools. This is the built-in tool inside the Internet Explorer. 
We have support for HTML5 in Visual Studio 2010 Service Pack 1 with uh, Web Standards Update. So we, you can uh, work with the CSS3 with, on IntelliSense level with the HTML5 and so on. You can use Expression Web 4 Service Pack 2. Or you can install Visual Studio 11 Developer Preview. And there is a very, very good support for HTML5 because it's brand new uh, tool. And just it's the developer preview. It means it's some you know, alpha version or something before alpha version. It's ready for hardcore developers. The resources, you have seen it yesterday probably. The book, Introducing HTML5, my favorite one, links to W3C and links to Microsoft Internet Explorer 9 and 10. So especially I recommend to you the engineering blog and ITES drive. Again, we are working with some web standards. So it, everything that is working inside the 9 should work in different web browsers because we are working with the web standards and we have only one web standard from W3C. And please fill my rating, rate my seminar. If you rate, rate it in the good way, you probably win. Okay. And we have, okay, we have some time for questions. Sir, question, please. No questions. You are tired. You want to go home and start writing HTML5 code. No. Okay. If there are no questions, thank you. Have a nice day and thank you for coming. Bye.